Okay, let's begin. Hello there. Uh, this video looks at volcanic systems, which are sometimes also referred to as volcanic classic systems. Uh, let's get started. To begin, as the name implies, volcanoes are the chief source of sediment in this system. This includes all types of volcanoes, including the example shown of Nova Erupta, a dome volcano in Alaska, White Island Volcano in New Zealand, and Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Tectonically, Volcanoes are typically found at, a, at plate boundaries. From a global standpoint, this is especially true at convergent plate boundaries and the entire rim of the Pacific plate, which is commonly known as the Ring of Fire. However, this isn't always the case. In some instances, volcanoes are formed by hotspots, which are not systemically bound to plate boundaries. The Hawaiian Islands and Yellowstone are both examples of hotspot volcanoes. <clears throat> Granted, there are both very different types of volcanoes, as the Hawaiian hotspot produces shield volcanoes and the Yellowstone hotspot produces dome volcanoes. There are instances of volcanoes where we don't know how they form or what fuels them. An example of this is Long Valley Caldera in California. What's even more surprising about this particular example is Long Valley Caldera is a supervolcano, the most powerful classification of volcanoes. This goes to show how much more there is to learn about volcanics and, by extension, volcanic systems. Now, simply put, a volcanic system is a region where volcanic activity is the chief actor in deposition in sedimentary processes. Sediments of this system are primarily volcanic clastic. Before we go get any further, there are a few points of clarification that I need to make. First, in the realm of sedimentary geology, volcanic clastics and volcanic systems are relatively new. What this means is that in terms and concepts in sedimentology were applied to volcanic classics. The problem with this is volcanic systems have quite a few foundational exceptions to the standard ideas of sedimentology. Two of the biggest that should be prefaced to the rest of the information here are its classification system and its nature of deposition. Both will be discussed at later points, but critically, sediments of volcanics are classified by both composition of themselves and a distance of deposition from their source vent. Deposition-wise, volcanoes deposit material very rapidly over incredible areas such as with ashfall or very densely such as with debris flow avalanches. This deposition during eruptions occurs in less than 1% of volcanic systems overall existence. This creates incredibly high degrees of interrelation between volcanic systems and other systems and environments. Volcanic systems produce sediment composed of igneous rock, ranging from mafic to felsic in composition. They are most distinguishable by the presence or effects of eruptions. Eruptions come in many forms. They can be molten emissions of igneous rock flowing like rivers in a phenomenon called pahoehoe lava flows. They can explode violently from volcanoes in supermassive ash clouds. Or the volcanics can be mixed and flow in mud-saturated water, mixes known as lahars. Further still, igneous material can erupt out of dikes on a continental scale to create massive flood basalt plains with layers of basalt uh, strata hundreds of meters tall and encompassing areas the size of states in some countries. These are just some of the ways which volcanic systems can produce volcanic classic sediment. Despite this range in formation, it is in eruptions which the vast majority of volcanic classic sediment is made. Volcanic classic sediment is well, also tricky because it is both physically fragile and chemically unstable. Because of volcanic classics high tendency to be eroded away or to be chemically altered into secondary volcanics or to become entirely different rocks, it's different it's difficult to determine the area that it represents on Earth. An example of this fragility is the Bishop Tuff pictured here, a welded tuff on the shores of Mono Lake in California. Among volcanics, it is more resilient to erosion. Even still, it is undermined to form the impressive structures seen here. However, best estimates place about 27% of post archaean sedimentary rocks as volcanic clastic. So, where can present day examples of volcanic systems be found? The first example we have is Crater Lake, also known as Mount Mazama in southern Oregon. The crater was formed after the Cerro volcano collapsed RFing 7,700 years ago via the destabilization of its magma chamber. 
The second example is Mount Vesuvius, a shadow volcano on the west coast of Italy, famous for its pyroclastic burial of Pompeii in 79 AD. The third is Mauna Loa, one of five shield volcanoes that comprise the island of Hawaii in the Hawaiian Islands. It is known for its effusive lava flows of Pohoihoi and A'a. While it hasn't had a major eruption since the 1900s, it is still currently considered active. The fourth example is too large and too obscured to be properly photographed, though this is Yellowstone. Pictured as Yellowstone Lake, part of Yellowstone's massive caldera. It's known for its supervolcanic eruptions, whose eruptions routinely inundate the continent in ash every few million years. The final example is Mount St. Helens, well known for its 1980 lateral eruption that produced the pumice plain pictured. Since 1980, it has had occasional volcanic activity that has slowly developed the volcanic dome inside its caldera. Volcanic systems are, distinguish, are distinctive for their eruptions. It's these sudden, dramatic geologic events that are both incredibly rare and set them apart from other systems. They are also one of the primary sources of igneous rocks. Even regions that are not volcanic and produce igneous rocks have volcanic tendencies. So how do volcanic systems work? How do they transport volcanic classics to their depositional environments? This graphic from the USGS gives a basic overview of primary transportation methods. The four key methods that will be touched on here are pyroclastic flows and pyroclastic surges, debris flow avalanches, and lahars. Ashfall will also be addressed at a later point. This is a pyroclastic flow recorded on the slopes of Sinabung Volcano in Indonesia in 2015. Pyroclastic flows are sediment gravity flows containing superheated gases and particles in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius and can reach speeds of 300 meters per second. Pyroclastic surges are similar, however, instead of being chiefly particles, they are predominantly gases. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any photos of surges, but basically they look similar to flows, but are not as beholden to gravity as flows, so deposit their debris more evenly across the ground covered than flows, but still leave less evenly the uh, less even deposition than pyroclastic fall deposits, which are also known as ash flows. The brief clip, this brief clip is a video rendered from the time-lapse photos of the debris flow avalanche that triggered uh, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Debris flow avalanches contain massive blocks that can be hundreds of meters large, as is the case here, in a matrix of ash and gas. They typically are entirely reliant on gravity for motion and hence have a very short range. Triggers for debris flow avalanches include oversteeping the slopes from deformation and destabilization from seismic activity. Lastly, we have lahars. This lahar was produced by Mount Raupau, I think, in New Zealand in 2007. It was triggered by the collapse of a tephra dam that released a literal lake it had been holding back. This is, I think, not the most common cause of lahars. Lahars are also caused by the heating and rapid melting of glaciers on volcanoes. Lahars produce a water tephra mix, which has the consistency of cement and can be heated to uh, lethal temperatures. All these modems of transport move tephra, which is an all-encompassing term for material ejected out of a volcano during eruption. I got, I got fed up uh, with trying to find decent photos of tephra on the internet. So pictured here are two samples of tephra, uh, pumice on the left and ash on the right that I have in my garage. The one on the left is a bomb-sized piece of pumice sitting in a gold pan. Despite its dinner plate size, it doesn't weigh much more than a basketball. The other is a vial of ash and lapelli from the crater rim. While both of these samples are highly felsic, tephra can also be intermediate and mafic, though I don't have corresponding samples of that. As mentioned earlier, volcanoes can occur just about anywhere. Aqueous volcanoes create very different volcanic systems. Pictured here are two diagrams, one of an aqueous eruption and the other of a terrestrial eruption. Some of the chief differences here concerns ashfall. Ashfall is greatly affected by wind and ocean currents, which spread tephra over thousands of kilometers. Aqueous currents are not as good at dispersing ashfall quickly, so material tends to fall in far larger volumes around aqueous vents, creating massive stratum. 
On the flip side, material that is suspended in water stays suspended in water for far longer than in air. Lastly, because some tephra, like pumice, contains gas pockets within them, uh, which are known as vesicles, it can lead to the largest pieces of tephra staying suspended the longest, creating reverse bedding. We've touched on the shadow volcanoes, dome volcanoes, and shield volcanoes. However, there's a bit of an odd duct that needs addressing. Flood basalts are a massive strata of basalt stratum that form from continental-sized extrusions and eruptions from dikes. Flood basalts, like the Columbia River flood basalts pictured, form over millions of years and are sus uh, suspected of forming from the Yellowstone hotspot. Flood basalts are typically columnar, having cooled gradually and extrusively. Their faces are also defined by their heterogeneous basaltic composition by which dikes uh, they originate from. For the Columbia River flood basalts, these dike groups include the Monument, Chief Joseph, and Steen's dike groups. The Columbia River flood basalts encompasses over 210,000 uh, square kilometers, and it was formed between 16.7 and 5.5 million years ago. The lithophases of volcanic classics in the traditional sense are described by their composition as being between mafic and felsic in composition, uh, which is for how much silica they hold, mafic being less silicic and felsic being more silicic. This gives definition to rocks that are mafic like the basalt on the top left, intermediate like the andesite in the top right, and felsic like the welded tuff and granite in the bottom corners. Further classification is given to their crystal sizes. Rocks with crystals large enough to be seen with the naked eye are considered intrusive, having formed underground, as environments for crystals of that size to form are only found underground. And rocks with crystals too small to see are considered extrusive, having formed above ground, as environments for crystals of that size to form are chiefly formed found above ground. The granite in the bottom left is intrusive as feldspar and quartz crystals are clearly visible, whereas the andesite and basalt and tuff in volcanic sandstone, the bottom center, are intrusive as their crystals cannot be seen with, by the naked eye. With this in mind, it's crucial to note that there are exceptions to this classification. One such exception is some geologists define volcanic classics further by their proximity to their source vent. Pictured on these two slides, are examples of further classification classification of volcanic classics based on their positioning along with typical percentages of rock types in variously distanced deposits. Uh, due to their incredible rate of deposition, volcanic classics typically form, uh, it's a German word, but Lagerstaten fossils or fossils of incredibly old preservation. This occurs because the sedimentation of creatures is not gradual but rapid, allowing for high levels of detail preservation. Pictured are mollusks and brachiopods from an unknown seamount eruption, ladrostratin from ashfall fossil beds, which formed 12 million years ago during the Bruno Jarbidge supervolcano eruption, which is currently known today as Yellowstone, and a tree cast from Mount St. Helens' eruption uh, 2 million years ago. As for ichnophases, based on the speed of deposition, I would strongly suspect that volcanic classic trace fossils exist. However, from my research, I can't find any definitive examples. In the U of concrete examples, I would suspect that ichnophases only occur from ashfall, where deposition of volcanic classics doesn't also destroy the older stratum. I'd respect tracks such as those pictured and burrowing structures, both terrestrial and marine, to be exceptionally well preserved. But I could also be wrong. It's fully possible that my lack of examples isn't because of uh, the potential ineffectiveness of my searching, but because they truly don't exist. Or it's also possible that they haven't been found because uh, marine seamount exploration is rather difficult. So sedimentary structures in volcanic classics are semi-limited by their aggressive nature of formation. Pictured and described here are examples of class supported poorly sorted normally graded beds. These are especially common in terrestrial volcanic systems due to their high energy deposition and indiscriminate sortation upon transport. With lower energy deposition, whether by different material or more distance from eruptive vents, finer sedimentary structures are possible. Pictured and described here are instances of laminate and some small low angle cross stratification. 
Underwater, a common structure is reverse grating, caused by larger buoyant material staying suspended for longer than smaller buoyant material, material due to uh, saturation rates, reverse grating occurs. Pictured are examples of pumice rafts, uh, one from space on the top left and one from a boat on the bottom right, uh, which are agents of reverse grating from an aqueous eruption in 2006. And here are some uh, beds of reverse grating, which, you know, <laughs> bigger rocks are underneath the smaller rocks. Sorry, bigger rocks are above the smaller rocks. Additionally, uh, channels are also very common as flows, surges, falls, and avalanches will commonly deposit into pre-existing waterways. Pictured as Lewitt Falls, just outside of Mount St. Helens' crater, the entire channel has been cut away in a mere 40 years. As mentioned before, Basie's association for volcanic clastics is incredibly valuable due to their long periods of dormancy, contrasted with their short periods of abrupt massive deposition. The first example pictured is volcanic facies association over time. The top left photo is of Spirit Lake on the north side of Mount St. Helens pre-1980. The top right is at two days after the 1980 eruption. Uh, before the 1980 eruption, the lake wouldn't have had a volcanic facies association, but during the eruption through the present day, pictured bottom, and for decades to come, the lake will be will have a high volcanic association because of the extreme deposition of ash in the lake. This cycle of association to gradually disassociation has continued for centuries and will more than likely continue for centuries to come. Time isn't the only way environments can come to have facies associated with volcanic systems. It can also occur over space. A uh, pictured here is the North Fork of the Toodle River, a tributary of the Columbia watershed that has so much deposition in it a sedimentary retainer dam had to be put in place to prevent inundation of downstream communities. Its channel was also completely infilled. Uh, this is, uh, in, in the background, you can see Mount St. Helens. I, I kind of forgot to say that this was part of the Mount St. Helens uh, volcanism. Conversely, the East Fork of the Lewis River, another tributary of the Columbia watershed, is on the south side of Mount St. Helens. Because of the lateral nature of the eruption, its channel was not buried and it was relatively unaffected by the eruption. So while its facies association is lower, it still flows on basaltic bedrock, so it has some association. Finally, because of volcanic systems remarkable diversity in location and their remarkable diversity in facies association, they are basically adjacent to all sedimentary environments and facies. These span from the Grand Canyon next to the San Francisco peaks in Arizona to the reefs forming the atolls in the Hawaiian Islands to the deep sea abyssal plains around black smokers in the Pacific.